What's up, guys? Welcome back to another afternoon edition of the Home Theater Hangout. Today, we're going to be joined by Matthew Pose. What's up, Matt? Hey, Shane. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good over here. So we're going to keep this uh, pretty casual today. So some of you guys know that I've moved into a new house recently, as of last week, and I've been on the phone with Matt talking on and off about some of the first steps that I want to take in building out my home theater so i've got pretty much a spare room and it's a nice size room it's like 14 by 24 with 10 foot ceilings so it's a nice size room um but what would be the first steps for somebody like me or somebody else moving into their new house with a similar size room maybe bigger would be what would be the one of the first steps in taking in developing this spare room into a home theater, Matt. And just in case you guys don't know, Matt Pose does also have a YouTube channel as well. He is an audio engineer. Well, I'll let you explain what you do, Matt. Sure. I appreciate that. Well, so yeah, essentially I'm an acoustic engineer um, and I design home theaters, media rooms. I work with uh, architecture firms and uh, contractors and doing things like sound isolation, sound comfort. Sound comfort is actually just the general idea of making a room so that the acoustics themselves are more comfortable. The room is less noisy, keeping HVAC noise down, making the walls more sound isolated. But my passion is always the audio side of things and home theater. Um, I, I work with uh, Anthony Grimani, uh, PMI, and we just do the engineering and a lot of big projects together. We have projects all over the world at this point, and I consult all over the world with what I do. Member of Cedia, and uh, actually probably going to be a trainer. They've asked me to do that, and we'll be teaching classes on a lot of the same stuff we're talking about here. And so, yeah, Shane, when you approached me and said that you were buying this new house, you wanted to find one that had a room you could convert into a home theater. It's really right up my alley. Obviously, a lot of the projects I do are pretty high dollar, but I like working on the more typical projects and uh, actually would like to do more of those where I can um, because they're more what you and I, I mean, like I get to work on million dollar projects. I can't afford a million dollar project for myself, yeah. you know, so it's more fun to like figure out what can you do that has a competently engineered home theater at a price point you and I can afford. You know, it's funny, Matt, is that you just assume that my small roomish is not going to be a million dollars. I may have misread that the page. <laughs> have another conversation. <laughs> no, I was kidding. He's not a million dollars. But uh, so you know my size room. So basically, I think, uh, I think at one point it was a garage. They mm -hmm. couldn't convert it into a room. It's actually about a foot and a half, maybe, yeah, about a foot and a half lower than the rest of the house. So like, the foundation of the house and it kind of drops down like two steps down so i think my regular ceilings are like yeah so my regular ceilings here are like eight feet but then in the theater it's like it's like 10 feet nine and a half ten feet so um i've got i've got a sliding door in the back of the room i've got probably should have took some pictures but i got a sliding door in the back of the room and then on the front of the house there's a a, a regular door entrance and then to the other side the if you're if you're looking at the door to the right side there are two windows so i'm going to seal off everything except for the door going into my main into the main house so obviously we're going to kind of remove the doors windows sliding door kind of frame it out uh, plywood on the opposite end some insulation and then drywall over that yep. to cover up those those uh those orifices well, in the room Maybe take a step back even and just say like, so you've taken a space that exists. Lots of people have the same situation. You, you buy a house, you're not building custom. You find a room that looks big enough to put a theater in like this one. Um, often they're called bonus rooms, meaning they don't really have a specific purpose. It's whatever you want to do with it. But you know, who wants a bonus room with no windows and doors? That's so typically they have that. But the other side of it is who wants a home theater with extra windows and doors? that ends up making it hard to do light control, sound isolation, et cetera. So the first step ends up being, okay, you've picked your room. It's not the right room. You have a choice to make. Are you going to put some money into redoing the room correctly? In which case you do exactly what you said. Take those windows out, take the doors out, reframe everything, fix the outside so it looks the way it's supposed to, make the inside then the core shell you need for the theater. The other option is to say, well, I don't want to spend that money. I don't want to put that effort into it. Maybe you want it to be able to be sold as a different, you know, the proper bonus room later down the road. And then in those situations, you just got to find a way to live with those sliding doors and windows 
but it's going to create compromises because they're often in places where speakers need to go or acoustics need to go and they affect light control. So in your case, you're doing it right. You're taking those out, you're reframing it. And you, you also want this theater to be sound isolated and the sound isolation serves two purposes. So one is it's going to lower the noise floor and that's a good thing. We want the home theater to be as quiet as possible so you can hear everything that's in the content of the movies. And then the other is that ultimately most of us that watch movies end up having to watch movies at night or at times when there's other people around that may not want to hear it. If your theater is loud enough and Shane, we deal with loud theaters, um, you can also annoy your neighbor enough that they could end up calling the cops on you. And I certainly have known of situations like that. Uh, in fact, I lived in a, a house once that was close enough to a neighbor's that when I turned it up, it apparently bothered them and they actually were nice. They didn't call the cops, but they came over to let me know it was too loud for them. Yeah. So, you know, by sound isolating it, you put yourself in a situation where you can rock out as loud as you want. You can play movies at full reference level and you're probably not going to annoy anybody that much. Right, right. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to isolate the sound? Well, so a lot of people get mixed up. So the first thing I want to make sure it's clear is there's a big difference between the acoustic treatment of a room and the sound isolation of a room. So the acoustic treatment of the room deals with absorbing and diffusing and even redirecting the reflections off of the wall inside of the room. But that's not sound isolation. Putting fuzz on a wall like this stuff doesn't really do anything to attenuate the noise that goes through it. I think the confusion comes from the notion that if something has an alpha coefficient, which is an absorption standardized coefficient of one, that it would imply to them that 100% of the sound has been absorbed. Therefore, if the sound is going through it, it can't possibly go through to the other side. But that's not really true. In fact, if you had something with an alpha coefficient of one on this wall, and we'll just pretend like it has that across the entire bandwidth from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and you pass sound through it, it's only about six to maybe nine dB of extra attenuation versus having done nothing at all. And that would assume big, massive, heavy duty absorbers. In mm -hmm. a lot of scenarios, it's more like three or four dB, which is not very much. What we really want to see is 20 to 30 dB or more of extra attenuation. Right. And the only way to do that is sound isolation techniques, which rely more on mass and decoupling, a little bit damping, um, and not on absorption or fuzz. So what you do, I mean, you could put extra mass on the wall. Some people do that, but you're not going to get a lot out of it. You get 6 dB of extra attenuation for every doubling of the mass. The mass of the whole wall structure, so the outside material, like the plywood, yep. the studs themselves, the insulation that's inside of it, and the drywall. So adding one extra layer of drywall does not equal 6 dB of attenuation. It's only like three or four. So really what you should do, which is what you're going to do, Shane, hopefully, yep. is take the drywall down. Because once you've done that, you've opened yourself up for doing everything else right, and you'll get some extra benefit out of it. So Shane, let's start with that. Did you decide to do that, or are you going to try to make do with what you got? Well, since uh, I haven't worked in two months, I kind of want to wrap this up ASAP. So taking down the existing drywall might not be the quickest option right now. It would not be the quickest option. Yeah. It is the right option, but it is not the yeah. quickest option. All right. So let's talk about that then. So we're going to talk about like, like retrofitting, I guess you can say really quick retrofit. Yeah. yeah. For the normal person, which For the normal person, I'm a normal person. I get it. Sort so of. when you get into a situation like that, then it does get trickier. So there are some things you can do. One thing you could do that could actually provide some benefit over simply adding more drywall, even though it creates what's known as a double leaf or triple leaf effect, uh, is you can actually add decoupling to the surface of the existing drywall and then add a little bit of insulation in there. It wouldn't be a big gap. You're talking like a quarter inch to half an inch of gap and then another layer or two really of drywall. So that would be like what I would call the better approach when you can't take the drywall down. That still would be time consuming. The difference between that and ripping the drywall down is maybe an extra day's work. Assuming professionals are doing it or people that have done this before. If you really wanted to be super quick That's not about me. it. That's not me. I'd be doing this myself. Yeah. So the, the super quick way to do it would be to use something like mass loaded vinyl. You could actually use green glue with the mass loaded vinyl as well. And another layer of five eighths type X drywall or two, two would be better yet or reduces labor, increases cost a little bit, you can go to a STC rated specialty drywall. So Pabco has Quiet Rock, 
I forget all the different brands, but I know Gold Bond has their own version. There's lots of different brands that make these. And some of these brands even have a retrofit drywall. And the way it works is that the viscoelastic layer is more decoupling than normal. It's one of the reasons why green glue actually has some benefit even on a non-decoupled wall is that in addition to the damping it provides, it also provides a little bit of spring, which is a little bit of decoupling. And that helps to give you a little bit more. So basically for you, Shane, I would recommend probably doing one of those scenarios where we add a couple of layers, add some damping, try to get some decoupling in there in the form of just a springiness from that compound or something like it. It's not going to give you that 20 or 30 dB, but we may be able to get six to nine and right. that's certainly better than nothing. Yeah. So talk about the green glue, like how many people don't know what green glue is? What is it? It comes in a bottle, looks like caulk caulk um or a bucket or, so, or a bucket yeah a big bucket if you want smear it on um so green glue is a viscoelastic adhesive like material it's not an adhesive in the sense that you can glue something together permanently it's actually designed to never harden the concept behind it is to create what are called constrained layer damped materials so if you look at the damping basically the best way to look at this is that you've got a spring mass system and the spring in this case becomes the green glue. The green glue actually provides, as I said, a little bit of decoupling between the layers of drywall. And it allows the two layers to slip a little bit. Now you're probably gonna say, well, how much slipping when you've screwed it in? The screws are far enough apart and the material flexes enough that there still is some slipping that takes place. You have to screw it because as I said, the green glue is not really glue and it won't actually keep the drywall from completely falling off. And so you'd have issues if you didn't screw it. And they did some testing actually to see how important it was and it didn't really make a big difference. So it seems like there's enough flexure going on in the drywall to allow this. And basically constrained layer damping is significantly more efficient than what's called free layer damping. So you can use a smaller amount of it and you get way more damping benefit. So damping provides benefit in two of the ranges of the drywall uh, sound isolation. One of them is there's a lower resonant frequency that's related to the uh, air cavity that's in the wall. So it's kind of like in a subwoofer, it's like the FS of the subwoofer. And then at the upper end, there's something called a coincidence frequency and it damps both of those and it gives you extra isolation there. And so that helps in the middle between those two, it's all mass. The green glue doesn't do really much of anything, except that, as I said, it does provide a little bit of decoupling, the spring part of it. And that extra decoupling helps to isolate more. So basically green glue is a compound you can add. It's lab tested, it's UL approved, and you can use it in a home. There are other products you could try, but a lot of them have been tested and not found to be as good. And a lot of them were never UL approved for use in or on a wall. And so you run into a problem of you never know what you're gonna get. And if your house ever burned down and they found out what you did, you may actually run into problems with insurance. So my right. recommendation is stick to something like green glue because it's a known product. Right, right, okay. So. Um... So if you are putting green glue between the existing layer of drywall and then new drywall, and then you screw it to the wall, how much torque are you putting on that screw? Is it going to squeeze out the green glue? Well, it's not really a major concern. There probably is going to be some squeezing out, but you put a good amount of green glue on it. And if you're doing a retrofit like this, I would definitely recommend going with, you know, obviously the minimum is two, but if you can go to three, it's really a good idea because you're trying to get as much of that spring as you can. That isn't what the product was designed for, but when they originally tested, I actually talked to the guy who um, had originally tested it and he told me that there was some extra benefit that yeah. was found above and beyond what theory said it should do. And it turned out that was the theory at least was it was the springiness. So you, you're going to screw it in all the way. Like you're going to put the, the screws in just like normal that they need to actually sit below the surface of the drywall so you can refinish the drywall properly. Yeah. Yep, it's going to squeeze a little bit out. None of it's a major concern. It's all part of the design. It's understood. It's tested that way and it's, it's okay. Got you. Okay. All right. So let's say we do that, do the, um, green glue, we pick a drywall. And obviously you went through a couple of uh, different types of drywall. You said the um, Type X, I think it was, uh, like 5 Ace. Yeah, that's a heavier, higher density, fire rated drywall. But and it's then, readily available. Yeah, you can go, like I, I priced it at like uh, Lowe's. It's, it was like, I think it was like 20 bucks a sheet or something like that, maybe 26. And then there's the acoustic ones, which are pretty hefty. They're like 100, 125 bucks a sheet. 
Yeah, the benefit is you are getting an engineered piece of drywall that's got higher SDC for it. And they actually do often test these for retrofit situations. So you kind of get a sense of what the real world performance is. So it's it can be worth it. It's it's also a time saver. I used to look at this as those drywalls are a waste of time because just enough layers of type X and green glue gives you the same results. But yeah. you look at the cost of the project and your time and labor. There's something to be said for an engineered product that will actually save you time. And that's what those do. So you may say, okay, I'm paying way more for drywall, but it's only costing me for the sake of argument, $5,000 more for the whole project. And I can get it done in a weekend instead of having to spend a month doing it. Okay. That obviously is not for the normal person, <laughs> not for me. Um, unless I can get a good discount on it, of course. Um, but, uh, all right, so uh, the green glue, drywall, and then, you know, I asked you, do you have to finish it? Do you got to tape? Do you have to mud? Because we're going to go another route with uh, fabric mate. Right. But you said that, yes, you do have to still tape and mud your wall, even though we're going to cover it up with something else. Yeah, I would strongly recommend it for a number of reasons. So the first reason is that you, you want all the air gaps sealed up. So one of the other things is when you redo your drywall, you got to take all the trim off. And Shane, I know that's extra work, but you've got to take all the trim off. <laughs> and the reason why you're going to take all the trim off is that you are going to have to caulk underneath the drywall where it's up against the floor. You're going to have to also go through all the outlet boxes and caulk where the outlet box goes up against the drywall. Because this wasn't designed for to be a sound isolated wall, we're going to have to fill all the gaps best we can after the fact. So you're going to take all that trim off. You're going to put the extra drywall up and everything. And then you're going to caulk everything. And so you have to finish it because the finishing also helps to seal up all the gaps between the drywall. The other reason is that you then do need to prime it. You don't have to paint it uh, if you don't want to. I, I'd recommend it because it's not a lot of extra work, but you do have to prime it. And the reason is that the drywall could absorb water. Otherwise, it's not as sealed. And so the primer will help protect it so that it doesn't fluctuate as much with changes in humidity. So because... So by, by finishing it off, taping it up, sound could still get between like screw holes and the gaps between, and that's the idea behind that. Yes. What about the ceiling? Same thing. So if you're not going to take the drywall down, which is the best thing to do, the next best thing is going to be to at least add some extra layers of drywall and some green glue for damping and a little bit of springiness. As I said, you can also layer in some mass loaded vinyl, something I didn't mention that isn't a terrible idea. So sometimes when we're doing even the decoupled walls, we'll use a layer of MDF or plywood. Plywood is very commonly used. I will mention MDF is cheaper and significantly denser. It's actually a better material to use. You can also use concrete board. So you could, if you wanted to, uh, put MDF or hardy board, concrete board up and then put a layer of green glue and then put a layer of drywall that type X five eights and finish it with Hardyboard probably would hold screws okay, but for sure MDF would. And then you can hang things from the ceiling and the walls without having to find the studs. Um, it also adds a lot of mass. So it's just one of the reasons to do that. So if you don't mind doing some extra layers, that's not a bad idea. So that that's your that would be your recommendation for like the first steps of what I would do for my space or anybody that just bought yeah. a place or has a spare room. There's something else we haven't talked about. So how many of the walls are what are called partition walls or inside walls? Just one. Just one. Yeah. Is it insulated? I don't know. I, is it insulated? I don't think so. I don't think it is. So with partition walls, one of the other things I would recommend, and if you don't want to take the drywall down, there is a fix for this. Um, and since you're putting an extra layer of drywall, it's actually not a big deal. You can do blown in cellulose insulation. Right. Um, so what you can do is you punch some holes in the top of the wall. You can hire a company to do this too, but you punch some holes in the top of the wall at each area where there's a bay and you kind of blow it in basically until it's nice and filled up. And then you just patch the hole and put your extra layers of drywall up because the, the hole is going to get covered up anyway. You might not patch it. It's not the end of the world, or you could patch it and just sort of do a crummy job and not worry about it. Again, it's not a real big deal. The insulation, though, would make a pretty sizable difference in adding extra isolation. That alone can add a good 6 dB of extra isolation by getting the insulation inside the wall cavity. And what about uh, what about outlets and where your speaker cables are going to come out of? You're going to have to obviously extend those out and like seal up around that. Am I correct on that? 
Yeah, and with the outlets, what we often do is use extension kits, caulk around that, and then when the plate goes back on, you can actually get these weather seal kits. And Shane, I'll show you the product that I like. It comes, I, I don't remember the name of it, but it's a special waterproof one. So a lot of the ones that are sold are made of foam, and their primary purpose is actually to stop air from traveling through. But the one that I like, which is about the same price, these things cost like pennies. I think the one that I get is maybe 25 cents each. Um, yeah designed for outdoor boxes and it's designed so that when you put pressure on it it will stop water from getting inside the wall which means it's going to offer a, it's denser and it's going to offer a better deal for the outlets all this stuff is like not a huge deal but you shouldn't ignore it and the cost is so little and the yeah. work what is so little that you really should put the extra effort in right 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 now if you um if you want to take a shortcut and not and not run your cables up the wall between the um you know, the studs and then come out of the wall. Could you leave a gap between the first layer of drywall and second layer of drywall? Yeah. So that's actually a pretty common technique we use, um, either doing it on purpose or cutting it in later. So you take the trim off the wall, you cut up some of the drywall out, or in your case, you could just not extend the drywall down all the way. Yeah. And then you tuck the wire in there. Um, you'd have to make a bundle that would kind of fit properly. And then when you put the trim back on, uh, it, it hides it and you get the wire where you need it. Here's yeah. the thing you're, we haven't gotten into this yet, but you're also doing stretch fabric in your room. Yeah. You, you can run the wire on the surface of the wall and hide it behind the stretch fabric yeah, in a room yeah, like yeah. yours. And yeah. then it's the same thing. You still don't see it. Yeah. We'll save that for when we have fabric made on. Cause I mentioned you, they want to come on to talk, talk with you as well. So yeah, I just wanted to cover, whoops. I just wanted to cover the, uh, the first, you know, like drywall steps, um, adding mass and all that. And, uh, you know, besides green glue, you didn't mention mass loaded vinyl, like tell the folks what that exactly is. Yeah. So mass loaded vinyl was actually invented originally as a replacement for lead. So in the old days, one of the ways we would make walls more massive and sound isolated is sheet lead. And as you can imagine, lead is toxic and it wasn't a great thing to be working with. So they outlawed its use for stuff like that. It's still used for other purposes. So it stops x-rays and so you can still buy it, but I don't recommend you use it and mass loaded vinyl serves a similar purpose. It's a vinyl like material and it's usually barium loaded, which means it's mineral loaded with something that's very dense and heavy. And as a result, what you get is something that's only about a quarter inch thick, but has the same mass as a five eighths uh, inch thick piece of drywall. So you get a lot of density in a compact package. It's a pain to work with. It tears when you, cause it's so heavy, it can tear under its own weight if you're not careful with it. It is expensive compared to drywall, but again, it goes back to the idea of, in the grand scheme of a project, the cost of it may not be that great and it can be a time saver. So we use it in a lot of projects. I have never used it in my own personal projects due to cost, but in my client projects, we use it all the time. And we use it in addition to green glue and drywall. Um, we often sandwich multiple layers uh, with it instead of using the free hanging method. There's debate about what the best way to do is in practice, we have found whatever difference it makes isn't worth it. But by sandwiching it, you are creating, essentially there, there becomes different acoustical impedances as the sound is traveling through the material and it helps reduce the likelihood that the material, that the sound is going to actually travel straight through the wall um, and, and helps to ensure more of it bounces back into the room, which is ultimately what we want. Yeah. Let's say somebody lived um, the, on their street, they lived at the end of a cul-de-sac. They don't have any neighbors. Is all of this necessary? So it's noise floor again. If you don't, if you're like single or you're married, but you don't have kids or you don't even care, I don't know, maybe you don't even care about whether they hear it or not. And yeah, you live in an area where you don't mind bothering other people. Then the sound isolation for the purposes of that is obviously unimportant. But where we still recommend it is reducing noise floor because there's always going to be noise sources coming into the room. You could have cars, you could have owls hooting outside, you could have even noise in the house, even HVAC noise. So when you make the room quieter in that way, the, the noise of the fans and the motors radiating through the house are reduced quite yeah. a bit in the room itself. Of course, you have to take extra steps for the HVAC to be quiet as well in that room. But when you're ripping the walls down, that's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want to just do some like quick hits like once a week. So today we just wanted to talk about adding extra mass in your room to keep um, sound from leaking out or from coming in. Obviously, this is not like soundproofing. That's a whole different other thing, right, Matt? 
Well, it's sound isolation. It's all the yeah. same thing, I guess. Soundproofing is kind of a misnomer, but I use the term too because colloquially that's what we all say. I, I guess what I would say about this is I've done videos before where I said like, don't just add extra mass. It's kind of a waste of time. And then you get these real world scenarios like Shane, you're bringing to me where it's like, well, but it's that or nothing. And you're telling me it's not worth it. Adding extra mass does provide some isolation. You're way better off ripping the drywall down if you can do it. You're going to get a significant increase. So the same amount of money, Shane, that you're spending is going to yield you, I think, lots of, you can do the math if you look up here, but I think about nine or so dB of extra isolation, maybe right. a little bit more. And had we decoupled it, we probably would be looking at closer to 20 or 30 dB of isolation. So right. same cost, more than double the isolation. Having said that, if the issue is, look, we can get an extra layer of drywall up and everything finished in a weekend. And if we do the other method, it's going to take a month. Like I was kind of joking before, I understand those issues and you're still getting, like I said, about 90 B versus nothing. And that's seems worthwhile. Yeah. Well, all right, Matt, let's take a couple of questions before we log off here. Marv would like to know, can I use OSB instead of drywall trying to finish my unfinished garage wall? Yeah, I, I mean, there might be building code issues that I'm not aware of, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't use OSB. If you're going to cover it up with fabric or paint it black or something, it doesn't really matter. Like I said, we use MDF and plywood and stuff in the walls all the time, so probably it's fine. If you decide to remove the drywall or you build from scratch, what are the other better options for isolation? That's a good question. So the go-to products that we use in all of our builds are going to be either hush frame, which I used in my theater, um, or the kinetics isomax there's equivalent products. So hush frame is a wood product. There's basically plates of plywood separated by silicone. The silicone creates a spring. It's about a quarter inch or so in thickness. It's very, very springy and it's well damped. Um, I happen to really like that product because it uses one by two furring strips, which are significantly cheaper, even for the better quality ones than hat channel. The other option is to use the Isomax clip with hat channel. I prefer that to the Arsic clips because it's got much more damping to it and much more spring and you get better sound isolation with that. Um, the negative with it is that the uh, hat channel is pretty expensive. So in total cost of the project, you can end up being at a higher amount for the same STC rating, but that, that would be key. The other thing is if you're going to take the drywall down, you could build another stud wall and create a chase wall or a double stud wall hmm. by increasing the air gap inside of the wall from that three and a half inches now to like at least seven inches, but really you'd have a gap there. So probably eight or nine inches. What happens is that you improve pretty dramatically the sound isolation of the wall because not only is it even more decoupled than it would be, but the resonant frequency of the wall drops even lower and the mass control region widens. And so that makes for a much more isolated room than you could otherwise have. Does it matter if both layers are different? So one layer OSB and one layer drywall with green glue in between. It matters, but this is going to be one of those there's theory and there's reality. In theory, the different layers have different acoustical impedances and should imp it should improve the sound isolation. You should get better numbers and it should be quieter. In practice, they've lab tested this and the differences often still seem to follow just mass law and it doesn't seem to matter. Well, all right, Matt, it's 30 minutes. Guys, stay tuned next week. Hopefully we'll have fabric made on or we'll think of a different topic. I think we're going to tackle maybe floors next week. But Matt, where can they find you and what kind of services do you offer? Oh, I appreciate that. Um, so you can find me at my website. So it's Pose Acoustics. And if you go to poseacoustics.com, pose is P-O-E-S, um, then you can actually reach me that way. My email is matt at poseacoustics.com. You can uh, reach out to me that way. And in terms of services, as I said, I do home theater design work and I can take on projects that are very small or very large. There's a cost to my services, so I will say if your project is really, really small and you're really struggling with budget, you may not want to hire me because I'm going to eat away from portions of your budget you can use for gear. But the other side of that would be that if you really don't know what you're doing, I'm an expert. And so I can come in and help you make better decisions and, and help your money go farther. Um, in terms of other services besides the design work, I also do calibration and commissioning. 
I'm hoping to travel more than I have been in the past. So I've been kind of turning people away a bit who have asked for me to come out to them just because with, uh, you know, my, my youngest daughter was born during COVID. And so when I started this company full time, she was still pretty young, but she's getting older now. So I can do remote calibrations. I can do in-person calibrations. I'm based in Sarasota, Florida, uh, which is the central Gulf coast area kind of near Tampa. So anything within three or four hours, I'll happily calibrate. And that takes me all the way out to Miami. Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, and those areas. And uh, so just give me an email, um, you know, reach out to me, and I can work with you and try to come up with something to help you make the best possible home theater you can make for your budget. Awesome, Matt. I'll also leave some uh, links down below in this video's description if you want to reach out to Matt, check out his website, or check out his uh, YouTube channel. I'll leave that down there as well. Make sure you subscribe to his channel, leave some comments. And if you guys can't afford him, make sure you guys stay tuned. The next time I have Matt on, you can ask the questions all you want and he can't charge you. Or if you want to super chat, you can do that as well. Uh, but thanks, guys, for hanging out with us today. I'll see you guys next week. Like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you.